My name is Giles Dooley, and I have two great passions. One is photography, the other is food. Fuck. <laughs> I document the impact of conflict around the world, meaning I'm often in new cities and unfamiliar countries. When I'm not taking photographs, I am on the lookout for new and exciting places to eat. Meals cooked from the soul with love and passion. But food means more to me than that. I believe I take a better photograph if I've eaten with the person first. Food is a remedy. It's how friendships are made. I would say when I'm cooking, I can hear my ancestors whispering behind me. <laughs> food is how the world connects and how I connect to the stories I tell. There are 1.7 million refugees living in Lebanon, making up a quarter of the country's population. The majority of those have fled from the war in neighboring Syria and are living in informal camps dotted across the Bekaa Valley. For 10 years, families have been struggling to survive in makeshift tents constructed from plastic sheets, cardboard, corrugated metal, and other discarded materials. When I first came here in 2014, it was the first time I traveled as a photographer since being injured whilst working in Afghanistan. If becoming a triple amputee has given me anything, it's that I now feel a deeper bond with those I document. That first visit to the camps in Bekar changed my life. I realized it was no longer enough to just document the terrible living conditions. I'd have to also act as advocate in the hope their situation improved. And when they didn't, I set up a charity to help some of the families who by now have become my friends. People like Fayez Alouche. Fah, Fah. Hello. How are you? I'm good, how are you, sir? Keep Yeah, keep fat. Yeah, you're looking, you're looking strong, huh? Where are you? And how are you? You've, you've grown so much. When I first met Fayez, Rabba and Shams, they didn't even have a tent. They lived in the space between two other families under a plastic sheet. Fayez had lost his leg following an illness he couldn't get treatment for due to the war, so he couldn't work or build a home. As a fellow amputee, I knew what he was going through. So we found a house, rented it, and now the family lives there. Because of COVID, it's been over a year since I last saw them. So, boss, how are you feeling? Hmm. And how's, how's your leg been? So next time I come, you'll be dancing. So what is it? What's the dish she's cooking? Kapsi. <laughs> I'm sure. The Syrians are the best cooks. So is this something you used to cook at home back in Syria? <laughs> but, but Syrians always are people that are very generous when they cook food. But Even though they're desperately poor, I've never been left hungry after visiting a Syrian family. In my experience, those with the least always give the most. And from day one, I've been fed incredible food whenever visiting the Bekar Valley. Syrian dishes like mujadara, meshe, kebe, and always with a side order of chips.
Wow. 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 <coughs> Thank you. He likes it when I come to visit. It's a feast. It's really good. Mm. It's delicious. This, I put a little bit of lemon on. This is when I'm happiest, is when I'm sitting eating with the family. So thank you for always making me feel part of the family. Mm. The rice is delicious, the flavor. Mm -hmm. Good, 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 good. Good, good, good. good. Hey. <laughs> You're always trouble. <laughs> but you know, it's nice to see him looking more healthy than the last time. But he's a little bit too noisy now. <laughs> I know. Honestly, it makes me very happy to see you all looking so well. Yes, it's so good. It's so good. Serious, you're getting serious now. Yes. yes. Into the salt, into the bread. Where I come from, we call this, this is a chip butty. <laughs> Why does he look so serious now? <laughs> What's happened to him? <laughs> <laughs> The family has been doing so well since moving to this new house, especially their daughter, Shams. So these cameras we're giving to other people at the school, and the idea is for you to be able to tell your own story. And it's black and white, and on each camera, there's 26 photos you can take. And you can photograph anything about your life that you want others to see. So it might be a tree that you like, it might be your mother, it might be a coffee or something you like to eat. Would you like to have a go? The part of the pre part of the project? Yes. Yeah? And then, when we get all the photographs from you and your friends, we'll exhibit it in London. Yeah? What, what do you think you might want to photograph? It's nice, you know, when I was 16, 17, I, I really was not very clever at school. But the first time I had a camera, it was like I could speak for the first time. So I hope this is your chance to tell your story to people all around the world. Yeah, you're fun? Okay, so for the first two photographs, how about I take your photograph and you take my photograph? Yeah. Yes? Great, okay, I go first. It's Shams. <laughs> I wait, 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 wait. Is my hair okay? Yeah. Yes? I look pretty? Should I look, should I look th this way or should I look at you? At you, like this? Hey! So thank you for being my first official photographer here. <laughs> it's very cool. See, this is you as a photographer. Bye. Bye. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Nearby is the school Shams goes to. It's run by the Beyond Association, a Lebanese NGO. I've been visiting here for years. Maria, who runs the project, has dedicated her life to supporting the Syrian children who live in the camps. Keep back. Good morning. Nice meeting you. How are you? I miss you. Yeah, it's good to see you. And all the kids missing you. Uh, so where are we going first? Wherever you want. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Say hi. Hello. Hi. Tina, pass the fire. Hello. 
Being here brings mixed emotions. The school is an incredible place full of warmth and you can see how the children flourish. On the other hand, visiting this school always breaks my heart. I've been visiting these classrooms for seven years. The youngest students weren't even born then. Many of the children here have only ever known life in a refugee camp. Most of these children have never even seen Syria. This is a lost generation. Children make up almost 50% of the Syrian refugees in Lebanon, and the children here are incredibly vulnerable. Many have been forced to work to support their families. بالمرشات with the, this issue chemical okay. to You're and it's and it's, yes, and it's worst form of child labor. Yes. He's 13 years old. 13. Thank you, Habib. Bye. Due to COVID, I can't go into the camps. I didn't want to risk spreading the virus there. But I wanted to find a way for the children to tell their own stories. So I handed out disposable cameras here as well. Photography is a simple but powerful way to let people tell their own stories. It's amazing to see the life in the camps through the eyes of the children that live there. That evening, I sit in a hotel and drink some wine that was produced in the same valleys where the Syrians live in makeshift tents. I've always found it hard to reconcile these contrasting lives. When I first came to the Bekar Valley in 2014, I was a broken man trying to rebuild my life. After my accident, nobody believed I could work again. But the families here welcomed me and trusted me with their stories. I've always felt they gave me my life back. And in some small way, I've tried to repay that over the years. Many of these families have become lifelong friends. I've seen their children grow, accompanied some when they were relocated to France or Holland. Although sadly, for most Syrians living in Bekar, nothing has changed in all those years. The next day, I have one last thing to do before leaving Bekar, to visit George Massad, who makes the best roast chicken and garlic sauce in the world. This is one of those places you only discover with a local's knowledge. I'm forever indebted to my friend who first brought me here. After all these years, I still haven't figured out how they make this garlic sauce. It is so good. Oh my God, I don't even need a plate. I have a new dance and a new song. Chips and chicken, garlic sauce. <laughs> I have to wait for the chips because you have to wrap everything. Exactly. Sugar. Okay, so this is like the holy trinity now. So it's the chips, garlic sauce, the chicken, the pickle, a little bit more pickle. For 10 years I've been coming here and I will never get bored of this. Mm. 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 Mm -hmm. It's hard to find a bad coffee in Lebanon. The country loves the stuff. Some of the best is to be found in cafes by the side of the road. I've stopped here many times in the past on the drive from Bekaa to Tripoli while documenting the refugee crisis. We always stop here, get a hit of coffee, keep you going all day. You know, one thing in, in Lebanon is the coffee. It's, it's kind of more like a slap in the face. Yeah. It's strong, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Man, so strong. <laughs> Tripoli is the forgotten city of Lebanon. This Mediterranean port is one of the country's poorest cities and has suffered from years of sectarian violence. But there is a raw energy to the place, with incredible street food, bustling markets, and an abundance of fresh fish and seafood. This city reminds me of Naples. It's a city that many fall in love with. 
One of my oldest friends in Lebanon is Yara. She knows the city well and is as close as anybody I know to understanding the complex politics. Hey, Yara. <laughs> so you choose the fish and which way you want it to be cooked. And this is all fresh? This is all yeah, from the market? All, yeah, all, all fresh. fresh, all fresh. Fish is my favorite thing. Uh, I love fish. The grouper, I mean. Grouper, okay, yeah, this grouper. Actually fish ever. Mm. He will do like a mix of everything and we will eat. Great, yalla. Yeah. Mix, mix, let's do this. Perfect. Look at this that. is the sauce that really drives me. Oh, wow. Their specialty, at least for me, is the garlic sauce. Like, I don't usually eat garlic, but here... You know me, anything with the garlic. I know, I know that, okay. This is the Yara way. <laughs> <laughs> Straight in the garlic sauce. Perfect. It's very good. I love pickles. Damn, that's good. Uh, this is it's tajin. Mm. It's tajin. And this one is tarato, like it's tahina with like, I don't know what. This is great. But this one. I mean, Tripoli, I've used to come here a lot when I was documenting the first time the Syrians first, yeah. first crossed. I remember, yeah. And it always felt like a place that, that should be an amazing tourist destination. It, it has the feel of a tourist destination, and yet at the same time, it's not. It feels like run down, it feels sad. The past few years, like, Tripoli had to suffer a lot from different political and economic incidents that happened in the country. Mm -hmm. Inside, in Tripoli, you can see the front line, you can still see yeah. the marks of the, of the country. When I was here happened. six years ago, I mean, they were firing at each other. Yeah. There were exactly. tanks everywhere here. Exactly. We were ducking. I mean, we, we went up into the hills and it was, it was and, really and full on. it created on. this whole image about Tripoli being a dangerous place. Personally, I don't find it a dangerous place. Whenever I'm here, I feel I'm at home. Like, I've always felt welcome. Part of me feels sad about what's happening, but part of me is like, like it's very normal. Like people really, they don't have the minimum for a decent life. Mm. We're talking about proper schools, we're talking about proper hospitals, proper jobs. Like people mm -hmm. who are educated and so on usually go to Beirut. We're talking about like all the negative stuff, but what was interesting is like there was a very growing startup community here. And, and like innovators and from the area found themselves, why not, like why to go to Beirut or why to travel? Why not to create something here? Why not to develop something here? It feels like a hidden gem of it Lebanon. Is, it is, You know, it something is. that every time I've come here, I've really enjoyed it. The seafood's amazing, the beach is amazing. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed like, um, you know, artists and some of the people I know in Beirut are now saying, actually, I'm thinking of Tripoli. More food. Thank you. So we add like some olive oil to the hummus. So. Thank you. I mean, right now in Lebanon as a whole, I think as an outsider and somebody that, you know, I hear on the news, it's hard to understand exactly what's happening. It's the result of years of corruption and mismanagement in the country. Everything else is the result. Like, even like the conflict that we talked about in Tripoli is the result of this. The uh, Beirut explosion is the result of this. Regardless who did it, why the uh, nitrate ammonium is in the port, mm -hmm. regardless of everything. This is what happened after the war. After the war, we didn't do a proper reconciliation among each other. And unfortunately, the same political elite who was like fighting made the agreement between each other and like the people had nothing to do with it, the Lebanese people had nothing to do with it, and weren't able to, to build proper institutions. And unfortunately, corruption became a cultural thing. It was something, if you are corrupt, you're brave, you're intelligent. It comes from our feudal system uh, history, is, is someone who would like, you go and ask for a favor, mm -hmm. you know, a service provider. It's, it's, like, it's like there's a minister for the railway. There's a director for the railway, but there's no railway. That's a different type of thing. <laughs> but I think now they're striking because, you know... But the railways are striking because <laughs> they have no railways? <laughs> it is just like... <laughs> this is one of the things. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not laughing. At this your... is one of the things, guys. Like, imagine like you're paying your taxes and they're going to the railways that you never... like. I never saw a railway level. No, but that's Except the thing. Except it was like, you know... Ne next to it was built a pub yeah. with, with, with like the theme of a railway. <laughs> no, I mean, only in Lebanon 
Would you have a minister for railways, staff the railways, but no railways? <laughs> this is crazy. But again, I repeat, it's if you bring everything together, it is related to a history of corruption and mismanagement of the country. Ah, the policy. It's good to add a smile to our talk. Like. One Syrian family that I've grown particularly close to over the years are the Hammer Shows, headed by Sana. When I met them, they were living in a makeshift tent on Wasteland. They had nothing. Sana's husband was missing, and the family was barely able to eat and survive. The youngest daughter, Paula, deeply traumatized after seeing her friends killed when her school in Syria was bombed, had tried to kill herself with rat poison. She'd heard her mother say she was struggling to feed the family and thought it would help if there was one less mouth to feed. She was just 11 years old. Thankfully, she survived. Now 17, she lives with her family in a flat that we rent for them on the outskirts of Tripoli. This is just one of thousands of families now existing without their fathers and sons. At least they have the security of a home, unlike most of the Syrian refugees living in Lebanon. Hello. Hello. <laughs> 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 Okay. Shukran. I'm very good. How are you? Shukran. It smells very good. Ah, thank you. So it's very nice to come and see where you live. It's very different from when I first met you, where you were living then. عن الخيمة وعن البيت. إيه الحمد لله حسن وضعنا كتير ولا تمام الحمد لله فضل الله. أول شيء لما كنا عايشين بالخيمة كان مثلاً إنه مثلاً براد شيء إنه حافظة أو شيء ما في كان إنه مثلاً مسراسير البرغش كله كان موجود كان في كتير أضرار بس لما أجينا لهون إنه لما انتقلنا صار في تغير كتير بحياتنا مثلاً صار في نظافة صار فينا نأكل شيء نظيف إنه صار في تغير كتير كبير بحياتنا كصح صحياً إحنا. الشيء سيء كتير كتير كنا نطوف بالماء. ما يلتقى عند أولاد لا أكل لا لباس لا شيء يعني كنا عايشين عيش كتير كتير بشعة كنت أنا حتى ونايمة بالليل فكر إنه بكرة نايم بدي أجيب وين بدي أروح أركض على الأمام أركض هيك ما أحسن وكل شيء حتى أيام كي نوم غير أكل أولادي أنا كان عندي جوز وعندي ابن وعندي بيت وعيلي وعندي عندي كل شيء أنا كان جينا لهون ما طلع عندنا شيء فجأة حتى هون بلبنان حرقت خيمتنا وهي بنت شربت السم من الجوع من الفقر بس أنا لو ضل ابني عايش ما بدي شيء من أهل الدنيا كلها لما نفوت على المطبخ أو بطبخ طبخة بتخيل ابني قدامي أنا بس على رقم التليفون ما يروح إذا أنا بهمله وما بحسن عبي أحيانا لأنه ما فهمت صاري بس خاف لا يروح لأنه ابني بيعرفه عندي إحساس يجي يوم يحكيني بي الحمد لله رب العالمين بس ما راح يرجع My mother died a few years ago and for me I still cook sometimes the dishes that she would cook for me and it's, it brings back the memories and I think food is very powerful for this أنا كل أكل بياكلها بنت إذا بس أطبخها بلاقي وقف قدام إحنا بالحرب خسرنا كثير أنا خسرت كذا شهيد من عيلتي بس كان حرقة قلب لإلي ابني حرق قلب أكثر من جوزي ملكي What what did he used to like you you cooking for him كان يحب كل شيء هو بياكل كثير بحب الأكل كنا دائما نغص ونكون على الأكل اللي كل عمالك بياكل بسرعة كل شيء كل أكل عنده طيبه well, he was lucky that, that when his time here, he had such a wonderful mother. And it was because of, of the war? Was it this what happened to him? كنا عايشين أميرين سوون بهد ما بعرف أصلا يشهد الله علي وبرحمة عيون ابن فيصل ما فيني أضحك من قلبه ما فيني أحضر فرح بس بتجاهل قدام الناس إني بضحك أنا ما فيني أضحك من قلبه. What is your hope for the future? I know it's difficult. Do you hope one day you can return to Syria? بس البنت هاي تكفي على ما تحقق حلمها والحمد لله بعد بدي أرجع على سوريا آخر شيء بدي أرجع على سوريا بس كيف بدنا نرجع ما في شيء بسوريا الحلم بسوريا مات ما في حلم ما في بيوت ما في ما في حلم حتى يمكن سوريا ما فيها عيشة غالية علي كثير أنا ما كنت شيء حبة تراب شيء مريحتها 
طبي اغلى منا بس كان ابني بكل مكان فيها فيها ما حسن عيش فيها You know, we have always supported you, and we will always try and do the things so that you can study, you can study, and, and yeah. Would you like to relax? So, thank you so much for letting me visit again. I thought I was going to get like a little bottle of olive oil. And you picked this? You made this? That's enough olive oil for the rest of my life. Oh. <laughs> thank you so much, thank you. As I fall down the stairs with my olive oil. I have another close friend here in Tripoli. Following the blast in Beirut, he'd chosen to come here. Marwan Shamani is one of the most talented artists I know, and he lives a life that seems more cinematic than real. His old studio in Beirut looked like a scene from a 1950s Parisian film, and now he's moved into what looks like a James Bond set. Oh, wow. 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 But what a great new space for you, huh? Were you there the day when it happened? I was going down, and I arrived at the moment. The only thing is I went directly to the studio because I have all mm -hmm. my... Uh, yeah. All my life inside. I was really... Uh, the oh. house was... I didn't care about my house. But the paintings, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they were okay? Everything was well, okay? Well, uh, look at this one. Stitches. Stitches. Wow. There's a big stitch behind, you know? I'm gonna write Blast Off. Uh, no, but really, I mean, what a... You have a piece like this, uh, with a story already, and then you have... And then yeah, and yeah, you have the scar. And this is a, a political uh, painting. Well, it's a revolution painting. But really, I mean, you were lucky, huh? It's... it's I was lucky. Considering where you were. Yeah, yeah, I was lucky. I love that you have like this whole space and then it's just like the little... <laughs> the same, same coffee. That's amazing coffee. Yeah, Where's yeah. this from? Uh, Tripoli. It's a coffee of my, uh, my girlfriend. So how was the last two, three years? I saw you traveling a lot. Yeah, I mean, last year was like 19 countries. Yeah. Non-stop. You know, actually this lockdown was good for me. Did you depress or no? No. Actually, I, I worked in some of the hospitals, the, the main COVID hospitals in London. Oh, really? Documenting the intensive care units. Okay, okay, so you were working. Uh, that was crazy. That was, that was strange. I was actually in some of the hospital wards where I was treated when I was injured. So okay. I was in the same intensive care unit that I had been ventilated on 10 years before. So. Okay. But were you afraid of the, I, uh, COVID? There's a thing called ARDS. ARDS is where your lungs fill with liquid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this the is main what, issue. This yeah. is the main issue. Yeah. Well, that's what I had when I got injured because my lungs were damaged. So I had ARDS. Okay. And I spent all the time on a ventilator. So I remember the feeling of choking oh, on the shit. fluid. Okay, okay, okay. It's the worst thing. You, you feel like you can't breathe. You're gurgling. So when it started happening, it freaked me out because I'm like, I, I've been there. I know what it's like when you're drowning yeah, yeah. in your own fluid in your lungs. So it brought back memories, but, but you know, it's my job. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, you've seen stuff. Yeah, I mean, I take a few risks yeah, before, so. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like. <laughs> so after the blast, did you say to yourself, why should I do something with when everything is happening? Yeah. Everywhere I go, this is what inspired this in the beginning. Like, I can go to Mosul in the middle of the fighting for Mosul. And you sit with a family and you eat a meal. And yeah. they laugh and they chat. And, and there's that moment then when you're eating where everything else disappears. You know, food is people's escape in the worst moments. In Afghanistan, they have a thing when they eat together because you have people from both sides of the conflict. Families even. Some families you have their fight for the Taliban and the government. But they all meet together every so often to eat as a family. Yeah, amazing. And they say, but when I'm holding bread, I can't hold a gun. <laughs> Oh. I don't want to do another picture of a Syrian sitting in a tent going, the world is shit. I don't want to go to mm. another war zone where a child had their, their face blown off and keep telling people, look. So how, how did you get this idea, in fact? We show the, the misery. We don't show the, yeah, yeah, yeah. that humanity, yeah. that laughter. Because there's almost a sense of like, we're not supposed to show that because we're, it's, to respect the people, you're supposed to show the, the sadness always. Uh. And I would come to, to Lebanon and I would sit and do a story on Syrian refugees and, and the editors would make it so that you would just have the pictures of the family crying. They would cut out the bit where we start eating and laughing. 
because we're not supposed to show it that way. Yeah, especially think, not no, showing for the yeah for outside the yeah. It's it's like, and I'm like, no, I want to show the bit you don't see, mm. because that's where you find that shared humanity. I have this restaurant in in, in Ashrafiye, Beirut. This girl is called Rita. She's a small cook, you know, a small, uh, really small, and I love to go and eat. She's so friendly. She's like very voluptuous to blondy, Lebanese, yeah. change. Very, very, she's nice. She, when, when, when you arrive, like, she, there's a, only man who eat at her place. <laughs> so you arrive, she, she, she does her meal. Mm. What do you want to eat, Habibi? Did you eat well, Habibi? <laughs> and then at the end, she offers you something to eat. Everything is about like, and when I say to my girlfriend, oh, I went there to eat, she completely <laughs> comes, to, do you like her food or my food? It's just competition with her. Amazing. Of course, my girlfriend cooked much better than it's, her. But you're like, it's not a competition. It's not a competition. Well, maybe I have to go there. Oh, yeah. You could say I ate in a fantastic small snack in Beirut. And you say, do you know Rita? <laughs> it was very special. Very special food. The girl is so nice. <laughs> Have you heard of it? Have you heard of it? <laughs> but when you say about food, you know, she, this girl, but it's a joke, but even my girlfriend say, she invites people, people like her because she's friendly and she gives it with, with passion. Nice, huh? It's amazing. So cool. Mm. Tripoli is changing. More artists and creatives like Marwan are moving to the city, and some really exciting restaurants are opening too, like Crop, that serves modern Mediterranean food amongst the gardens that produce the ingredients on your plate. You couldn't eat anything fresher. I'd arranged to meet Marwan and his partner Saha for dinner. You know, you just know when something is like fresh. Yeah, yeah it's super fresh here. It's... They take good care oh, of it. Smell. Mm. This is rigatoni. It's a rigatoni, pasta yeah, with the mushrooms. With mushroom sauce. Yeah. Ipochini that is dried okay. and imported mm. inside as well. Beautiful. Always try the nearest first. Because <laughs> oh, mm. well, I can smell it. I think I'm more lucky than you. I feel this one better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Which best present? Ipochini. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. It's literally growing on the. Oh, yeah. Mmm. Mmm. Hey, that's nice. It's strong. It's good to eat such things because when you sweat, yeah. it regulates your temperature. Yeah, Rita does the same. She gives me every time. I, she gave me some. Rita, in your dreams. Yeah. In your dreams. She, she regulated. Yeah. Uh, sure. She's going to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> you know Rita, right? You know the story of Rita, right? And we have it on film. Oh my God, I can't believe it. I can blackmail him now forever. At the end of the meal, what does she say to me? Did you like it, Habibi? Do you want more, Habibi? Uh, she's very friendly. What do you want to eat, Habibi? I thought you want to tell the banana story. No, I don't tell the banana Why? Because it's... A, it's Show not... her reality. You know what she does after they finish? <laughs> I te I'm telling you, after they finish yeah, food, you know what they do? She throws a banana on the table. <laughs> can't believe she throws a banana. <laughs> that's, a, that's just such a phallic symbol. <laughs> Such a phallic symbol to throw up in No, I mean, really. I get very, so fucking In a jealous. small plate, and she give me a banana. I get so fucking Habibi. jealous. Habibi. This woman is up to something. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Hamburger. French spicy and truffle. 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 Oh. They're all different, you know? When you taste each one... Very mm. The truffle is so good. Truffle is good. Wow. Which one? This one is a truffle, truffle. right? Mm. Absolutely amazing. Do you cook as a hobby or as a... <clears throat> when I get back to the UK, I do like a residency as a chef. So I'm doing a residency at the moment in, in the UK. I always cook with people, even in the middle of a war zone, before I photograph them. And we spend time eating. Because for me, the difference of an acquaintance and a friend is when we've eaten together. 
And I would never photograph anyone that's not my friend. It's so Arabic. In, that is so Arabic. You know? So that's Check the way I work. Check your jeans. <laughs> <laughs> My conversation with Marwan made me think of Sana and Huala. Like every other Syrian family, they've always cooked for me, and for once I want to return the favour. So I had the slightly impractical idea of cooking for them on the beach. You know, if you want the best fish cooked, you speak to the fisherman. Can I get some of the, the calamari? Food always tastes better if you saw the person that caught it. I mean, you don't get fish fresher than this, right? I'm making a stew, like cooking ah, various things. What's best? Lionfish. Lionfish. Yeah, yeah. I've never had lionfish. I want to try it. Perfect. Yeah. Ah, this is like a. What's the worst that can happen, right? <laughs> a fish that kills you. Two kilo. Okay. And I'm not the fool. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hello. How are you? Kifak? Oh. Hey, we have to be. <laughs> it's very hot. It's impossible for a one-handed man to cut himself. So today we're making Italian food like my grandmother. Of course it will be good. All good food starts with lots of garlic. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Well, we need some tomatoes. Okay. As you know, every time I visit, it's always chaos. What, what is normal? <laughs> Only I would end up like sitting on a concrete bench by the side of a road <laughs> trying to cook. And I remember the first time I met you, was, it was near here, huh? Without a veil, yes. You were just, I think, 11 years old. Yeah. You all living uh, in those tents by the sea, it was very sad. Good. Well, as I say, when I think of where you were when we first met and all that you've achieved, it's incredible. And I also remember when I came to visit you once and you were working uh, again somewhere near here and you were picking olives and you were only like 12 or 13 already working picking olives. In Italian food, everything has a lot of tomato. I want to, can I taste, I'm going to taste this. <laughs> <laughs> we have to taste the food. What else have we got? Lemon. Lemon. Play, play. Play, play. Okay, do you like, do you like, play, play. Play, play. Play, play. So I love spicy food too. Too much? Hal, hal. Look, okay, I, I, I eat this one. Actually, it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we just put one in. I can't speak now. It's too hot. <laughs> See, this is my problem. I like, I try things without thinking. You see? Okay, the fact that I did it once is stupid. The fact that you did it as well is really stupid. Um, me? You look surprised that a man's going to do the cooking. <laughs> you don't trust me. Okay, you're in charge, then I'm your assistant. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Good job. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. 
<laughs> hey, you, you go, boss. Perfect. Ten minutes. Who wants to go and get some seawater? <laughs> ah. You want this? Okay, so this is what the fishermen would do when they're at sea. This is why it's called aquapazza. Because when they're out at sea, they don't have salt, but they just take water from the sea and add it. So we, so we season with the sea. You know, this is the kind of thing I do with my family. We're all a bit crazy. We just go down to the beach, we just cook something on a fire. <laughs> That's the Syrians. Always more salt. Always more salt. Always more sugar. Always more salt. Okay, we get some more water then. More sea water. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I did, I did the Italian part. You do the Syrian part. <laughs> okay. I think we're done. Okay. Come join. The important uh, question is whether the mother likes it. I'm happy. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> but you know, the best thing about food is sitting with your friends. It can be simple. I've been coming here for seven, eight years documenting Syrians living in this area. Even when you've all had nothing, every Syrian family here with nothing has always cooked for me. All things considered, we did okay. <laughs> the simplest things in life. People are always asking me, what's the solution to the refugee crisis in Lebanon? What can we possibly do? But it's not complicated. We don't need to keep discussing policies and ideas. It's simple. For children like Haula, they just need some stability and an education. The debate isn't what to do, it's whether or not we have the will to actually do it. When I think of Haula, when I met her and the person she is now, talking excitedly about her future and preparing for university, well, she trained to be a doctor. She should be so proud of what she's achieved. I head back to Beirut to see my friend, Kamal Muzuwak, a social entrepreneur who is responsible for the Souk Al Tayeb food market and the legendary Towlet restaurant. <laughs> it's the first time I've seen him since the explosion. The food market, Towlet, and Kamal's home were all destroyed by the blast. He's moved to a new flat and I was his first guest. Shall we begin? Yalla, tabbouleh. Mm. Mm. So when do you think the farmer's market will reopen? I don't think. We had the market this morning. Uh -huh. Are you okay? Or yeah, that's perfect. Chin chin. Cheers. Saha. The producers were coming from like farmer's wives and things like that, was that Yes, the... absolutely. And so for them, it must have been very tough as well, the last... It was the last what? Well, I mean, I was, that, no, that's why I stopped. <laughs> that's why I stopped, because I was like... The last months, no, the last cause... years, the last decades. <laughs> well, that's literally why I stopped myself, because I could work out what time that would... What scale, because... The last year has been very tough. Since October yeah. 17, you know, uh, work has been very, very difficult, mm -hmm. and the uh, economy dropped, like, by I don't know how many percent. Uh, mm. The lira, the Lebanese currency, has been devaluated, so it has been a total catastrophe. And if you had few uh, pounds, few liras in the bank, it's completely blocked, and mm -hmm. you cannot dispose of your money. So it has been a total catastrophe since a year, and it has been like one catastrophe after the other. And every time we were saying, like, we hit, uh, what do you say, bottom Rock ground? bottom, yeah, rock, rock bottom. bottom. So, and every time there's something worst. Mon tabouleh. Mm -hmm. I like to mm -hmm. eat my tabouleh, obviously, with yeah, yeah. a piece of uh, 
lettuce or a piece of cabbage that I don't have tonight, but like <laughs> it's a beautiful uh, yeah, lettuce it's... from one of the farmers today. I think for a lot of people outside of, of Lebanon, they see what happened with the explosion as being the big catastrophe, but really that was the end of a series of, of catastrophes. I hope it's the end of a series. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's delicious. So the farmer's market came first in 2004, like 16 years ago, and it was about supporting small-scale farmers and producers mm -hmm. come to where there's demand and purchasing power, so how to come to the city. It's about supporting mm -hmm. wonderful people and perpetuating agriculture, traditional agriculture, clean practices, or organic ones, and how to transform this agriculture into a cuisine, and how this cuisine and this agriculture are the best expression of identity. Like through a piece, through a bite of tabbouleh, I'm um, giving you, you know, a full story of Lebanon better than any speech or any book or anything else. How do you want to go on? Some lubie yes. or some potato and hummus oh. or the meatballs straight away, the kafta? Maybe we should have the meatballs. Yeah. Kafta is meat with, mixed with a bit of onion. onion. It's our local meatballs yeah. and parsley. Mm -hmm. Mm. Smells good. How's your kafta? It's beautiful, delicious. I have a friend in Beirut, and he said for the first time he felt he'd lost hope. Yeah. That That's what you're all, all saying. Mm. <laughs> like, either we're staying and we're going on, mm -hmm. because you cannot stay put, you know, or you're just leaving. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, when I got injured, I spent a year in hospital. There was a moment, maybe three months after I got injured, and I was told, you're not going to walk again, you won't do this. And I realized that I couldn't control most of what was happening. I couldn't control how many operations I needed. I couldn't control if I was going to be in hospital for another week or another year. I knew it was going to be a long time. But I'd been angry at all these things. I wanted control, and I had no control. Mm -hmm. And then one day I said, okay, don't think about the things you can't control. Focus on what you can. I don't know how long I'll be here. I don't know if I'll be walking at the end of it but I can control who I'll be. And that gave me a real sense of power that I could define who I was gonna be at the end of it. And so for me, you know, I, I became a better photographer. <laughs> the year I didn't take any photographs, I ended up a better photographer at the end of it. Because for the first time I reflected on it, I thought about what I was doing, what I really wanted to do, how I could adapt that. Even, even when I was unconscious, what, in intensive care, I had 46 days where I could only communicate by blinking. And you remember that? I remember it. I had 46 days. So after about a week, I realized that I had to gain control because I couldn't speak to anyone. I couldn't communicate with anyone. And you were conscious all this time? Yeah. And I'm strapped to the bed. I couldn't move. I couldn't, didn't go to the toilet. I was fed. Nothing. Only blinking. Only thing I could control. And so I didn't even know the time because there's no clocks, there's no windows. And I realized that the nurses they came at the regular, yeah, there was a regular <laughs> interval where they came and took my blood and pressure. So I said, that's a unit of time. Mm. And what I did is I created this project and I called it 100 Portraits Before I Die. And the idea was each person I'd always wanted to photograph. I imagined the people that I'd never photographed. Then some of them were dead, living, but famous people, interesting people, people from literature. And I imagined doing the photo shoot with them. Mm -hmm. At the end of it, say, actually, maybe I should have shot on this film and maybe a different camera. So I would, in the next shoot, I would imagine using a different camera and the results of that. That changed the way I work. So before that happened, my accident, I was shooting on a digital camera, 35 mil camera. By the end of 46 days of, of being in this lockdown, I was shooting with a Hasselblad on black and white film, a medium format camera on a tripod. That all happened in my head, but that's how I work now. And that changed my whole career. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing how the worst experience I mean, I couldn't think of anything worse for me. It ended up being the greatest turning point for me. It needs a lot of trust, I think. Trust in life, you know, so that you know, okay, it's 46 days, but I'm gonna make something out of it, you know, because I'm getting out of it. But you know, on day one... Oh, I mean... It's very difficult. On day 46, maybe you learned that, but like on day one, it's... Or you've gone mad. You are just <laughs> in, in, this is what I was saying, either stay put and, you know, just disappear and die, mm. or you need to react. Like people sometimes tell us, like, you were so quick, like in, in less than a month, you rebuilt the souk, you know. Mm. Some people are saying, like, thank you, you're giving us hope and courage yeah. for us to continue ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. for themselves, I mean. 
And as I said, like, it's, but like, we cannot not react. Mm. Like, as you're saying, you've, you've been thrown in, in the frozen sea, what do you do? Like, mm. you cannot not do anything and you must mourn our losses and deaths and everything, but like, then what? Yeah. Well, it's the same if you lose your limbs. Yes. You know, they're, they're part of me. I lost three quarters of my, <laughs> <laughs> three quarters of my body in many ways. But I would say I, I could never think about the things I can't do, but focus on what I could and, and yeah, excel and enjoy those things. Thank and, you. And food is the greatest pleasure, <laughs> you know. So, cheers. Saha. 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 Health. The next morning, I meet up with Anthony Rahail, a well-known food blogger who has promised me the best eggs and fool I'd ever had. Anthony. Hello. How are we? How are you? <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> All is well? Good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So chickpeas, simply, it's called balila. Hummus, fool, or the fava beans. Uh, the famous It's fool. always they're decorated with a bit of uh, chickpeas. Msabbaha, chickpeas with tahini. And that's something I love as well, is when you take one ingredient and then just do it in different ways and... Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. For balila, you mix it a little bit. Oh. Really incredible. It's like butter. Yeah. This is incredible. This is like uh -huh. next level. Okay. No one <laughs> does it else in Lebanon. And this is the one in the lamb fat? Lamb fat, cut in small pieces, like chips. Mm -hmm. Wow. Allow me. Okay. Mm. Absolutely incredible. Wow. A kind of lamb yeah. that only lives in Lebanon. It crunches like chips, like crackers. Oh, yeah. uh, it melts like butter and... Uh, that's, that's mountain food to keep you warm all day. Okay, I'm gonna steal this now. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> just for uh, research purposes, I have to have a little bit more, just for research. <laughs> just because I want to be sure. Yeah, I want to be sure, yeah, like, I, I'm I not sure understand. of the taste. I, I, I want to be absolutely... Anybody that knows me knows I love fried eggs. But cooked in lamb fat, this was the first and definitely the best fried eggs of my life. Egg. Whole eggs with Awarma, awarma is lamb meat. And voila. I'm just going in here. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I just told you. <laughs> the main ingredient everywhere is the love and passion mm. of this amazing guy. Yeah. I'm just gonna stay here for a little while. Thank you so much for uh, yeah, bringing me here and introducing me to this. It's, Exceptional, exceptional. This might be the best ever coffee and eggs. Tony, you've spoiled me. Like, breakfast will never be the same now. Well, I promise every time I come back to Beirut, I will be here, first breakfast, every time. Mm. This was a simple meal based around chickpeas. I'm always discovering new ways in which this humble staple is used. Before I leave, there is one person I really want to meet. Bonjour. Uh, Rita? My friend Marwan. Marwan, the painter, he told me all about you. You are, you are very famous. That's why I came all the way from Tripoli, because I've heard of your beauty and your food. Hello, Rita. You ready? Perfect. I've heard so much about you. You're legendary. Merci. <laughs> Marwan said, when I was in Beirut, I had to come and see you and eat here. He goes, everyone in this area loves Rita and knows Rita. Well, maybe, you know what I need to start? Can I just start with the coffee? Can we have a coffee first? Perfect, Rita. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Everyone told me that when they come here, they feel at home. Eh, يعني كأنه أنا ماما. And also, I heard 
maybe from Marwan, that often the wives are jealous when they come here. I don't know. I'm just maybe I heard. Why? <laughs> 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 I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yes. I don't know. 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 I You are the boss, you're in charge. ما خليني اقوم شوف شو بعد في عندي هيك قصص تبل وهيك قصص ونزل لك طاوله لحتى تدوق من كل شيء شوي 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 لا تروح تخبر مروان انه انا كثير 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 اهتميت فيه. شو؟ بيرفكت بيرفكت اوكي انا رح اقوم حضر. ثانك يو. يلا. I wonder what treats awaits me. Good. It's amazing, Rita. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Wow. Finish up, kiss. It's just for us. Yalla, tfadal. Okay. Into the day, to the mazbat hale, to the mazbat dafire. Ya welcome from Allah. Hey, fakrune, khut ya. Hey, tala hon. Hey, la ali. Ha, la andi khut. Okay, I go. 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 Eat. Hmm. Huh? <laughs> Good. I feel like I'm in your home. Mm. Perfect. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I I travel the world. I eat a lot of great food. The best food always comes from the heart. Mm. And you have a big heart. I'm so happy the world. Cheers. Cheers. Mm hmm. It's good. Mm. فتوس كتير جود مروان بحب هاي ليك هاي دي الماما الماما عم كبر حالي ثانك يو دو في بتحب الباذنجان امم يو ار فيري جينيروس يو هاف ا جينيروس سبيريت يو لاف تو لايك ميك بيبل هابي وذ فود خلي كل الناس تنبسط عن جد ما في شوف حدا جعان حرام اهم شيء الواحد ياكل ويشبع في اقل شيء الواحد ياكل اقل شيء الواحد ياكل ويشبع Especially in these really difficult times, like food brings happiness. Hey, you can see someone who is in pain, who can help him? No. 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 This is good. Yeah. Kebab. Okay. Good. Eat. 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 <laughs> Mm. Mm. Good. It's really good. It's this. Kafta batata, good. Kafta batata. Kafta batata. Marwan had told me that you were so full of life and energy. I didn't know what you looked like at all. And I wasn't even sure of where this place was. But when we drove by here, I said, I bet that's Rita. I could see your big smile and your energy. So I knew it was you. I felt that this is me. إيه أنا بس تكون هيك زي مع مدام مع جوزة ما بقعد بظهر بقعد ورا البراد إذا كنت لابسة تنورة إيه إيه أو حط مريول وبظهر <تصفيق> بقعد جوا مسكر باب ضل جوا إيه شو؟ هلا خبرك مروان مزبوط عني ولا لا؟ Why do you think I'm here؟ شو؟ ما جاي تشوف إذا كذاب Yeah, he's my friend, so I, he's my friend, he talks a lot. So I said, I need to find out for myself what Rita is like. No, this time he was telling the truth. If one person represents the spirit and strength of Lebanon to me, it's Rita. We all loved her from that day. When I asked people in lockdown what they missed the most, Nobody talked about a fancy restaurant or a Michelin-star dish. They said they missed eating with friends. Shared food is how we cement friendships, show love, and even, I believe, recover, even if just for a few moments, from the most overwhelming of crises. That's what this trip has been all about, a reminder of what a shared meal really means. <laughs>